Good morning. Welcome to the 33rd lecture of this course. Today we will take to begin with an example as to how we should compute the boundary thickness, lamina sublate thickness and subsequently find out the velocity at some distance, given distance. So please read the problem carefully. Okay. The velocity is given to you 200 meters per second and the aircraft wing is treated like a two dimensional flat plate. Density of air is given, kinematic viscosity of air is given. In case it is not given to you directly, if the temperature is known, you can always look from the tables or graphs and find out the kinematic viscosity. Now the problem is to find the boundary layer thickness, thickness of the laminar sublayer and the mean velocity at a distance of 2 meters from the leading edge. So your distance x is given and let us see how we proceed with it. Now normally the technique is very straightforward and we need to pick up the right kind of formulae because each formulae works in a certain range of Reynolds numbers. Right. So let us see, go step by step at x equal to 2, always you need to first establish the Reynolds number which is equal to u into x divided by nu and that is equal to 200 is your velocity, x is your distance and nu is 1.5 into 10 power of minus 5 which is equal to 2.66 into 10 power of 7 which is far far greater than the critical Reynolds number which is 5 into 10 power of 5. So this indicates, this indicates that the boundary layer is turbulent at the end of the plate. However, it is always a good practice to find out what is the length of the laminar boundary layer distance, okay. Means you remember always the boundary layer starts as a laminar boundary layer after a certain distance when the Reynolds number exceeds 5 into 10 to the power of 5 the boundary layer transforms to a turbulent one. So to find that distance where this occurs all you need to do is this Reynolds number at xc, here xc stands for the distance from the leading edge at which the boundary layer becomes turbulent. So u into xc by nu, I equate it with the critical Reynolds number and whatever value of x I get from here which is also the xc which comes out here in this case as 3.75 centimeters. U is here, if you see here xc, this is your uh, Reynolds number, this is your viscosity 1.5 into 10 to 5 divided by U which is 200 meters per second. That gives you 0 0.0375 meters which is 3.75 centimeters. So what does that mean? Supposing this is the length of your aircraft wing and this is 2 meters distance where we need to find all the details and all that it says is within the first 3.75, roughly 3.75 is less than 2 inches, this much, this much distance. That is the distance where the boundary layer becomes turbulent. So since this length is very small relative to the distance we are interested in, we can treat 
as if the boundary layer is turbulent right from the beginning. Why we do that is that application of the formulae becomes simpler. That is the only thing. However, if you want to make a correction for the initial boundary layer as a lamina 1, formulae are available. So, here I make a comment that as x c is very small, the boundary layer may be treated as turbulent starting from the leading edge. Okay. That means now we have the liberty to apply all the turbulent boundary layer relationships. So, this is to justify you simply do not start right away saying let it be turbulent right from beginning. You need to justify that is what is this bit of exercise. Now, for a turbulent boundary layer the coefficient of skin friction is given by this formula 0 0.0594 divided by Re x to the power of 1 fifth. Now, here again keep in mind the formula may look similar, but these coefficients and even the exponent of the Reynolds number they could be different in different ranges of Reynolds number. We will come to that little later when we talk more about drag force. But just keep in mind this is not valid for all ranges of Reynolds number, only in certain range. And the range that you are talking about 2.66 into 10 power 7 is the place where you can use this formula. So, it is a mere substitution of this Reynolds number here. So, you get the coefficient of screen friction which is defined as tau 0 by half rho u square equal to 1.953 into 10 power minus 3. Okay. Therefore, from this definition what will be tau 0 equal to? This Cf multiplied by half rho u square. So, the purpose of always calculating the coefficient of skin friction is that from there I would like to find tau 0. Now, nowhere in the problem it is said if you go back to the problem here, nowhere it is directly said the boundary that you should find out the boundary shear tau 0. It is not implicit there. However, why am I doing all this? Why am I first trying to find out tau 0? Through some formula, CF formula is available. From there onwards, I can find tau 0. And if I do so, what is the purpose? Why am I interested in tau 0? It is not that I am calculating with a certain purpose. So, what is that? See, always in all these boundary layer equations, u star comes into picture, weather distribution, any many things. So, how will I get u star by definition square root of tau 0 by rho. So, whether it is asked for or not in a problem, you need to always find out the boundary shear that is the most important parameter. From tau 0 you will next find out what is the shear velocity u star. Then we talk about the other formula. Okay. So, therefore, the wall shear stress tau 0 equal to this number multiplied by half this is your rho of air multiplied by u square and that comes out with 42.97 Newton per meter square. Now, you better check these numbers there could be some error, but do not worry about the sum there is error small error do not worry about it, but follow the steps that you need to do when you tackle a problem. Therefore, this is what you are looking for finally, shear velocity u star equal to root tau 0 by rho. This number here rho is 1.1 it comes out as 6.25 meters per second. Here again I reiterate that although we call shear velocity is 6.25 meters per second, this is physically it is nothing that nothing which flows at that velocity. It is only a number square root of tau 0 by rho and it has a dimension of meter per second that is why you call that as a shear velocity is it okay. So, do not interpret it velocity means as if something is flowing it is not that it is only it has dimension of velocity 
and it is based on tau 0 that is why you give the name shear velocity. Now what happens to your laminar sublinear thickness if you recollect last lectures the plot there is a laminar sublinear followed by a buffer zone which is followed by a logarithmic distribution on all the three happen to be within a thickness of how much from the from the boundary wall with a, what is that thickness in which all these three zones exist laminar sublinear plus buffer zone plus logarithmic velocity what is that how much is that that is 0 0.15 times delta that 0 0.15 times delta which you call the wall region has three different sub zones okay and in every sub zone the distribution is different but there is a one commonality among all the three what is that commonality why do we call that law of the wall wall means boundary in fluid mechanics jargon and it is nearer that wall or boundary and the relationship that is satisfied in that 0.15 times delta delta stands for boundary thickness what was that relationship you recollect u by u star is a function of y u star by nu now what is that function it is different for sublayer it is changing from the sublayer to the logarithmic and finally it is logarithmic so wherever you are able to express u by u star as a function of y u star by nu that total zone thickness is what you call the wall region and that law is called the law of the wall okay so if somebody asks what is the law of the wall in a boundary layer you should immediately answer that that is the zone where u by u star is a function of y u star by nu okay all right so there again when i presented the diagram where on the x axis you had y u star by nu y axis u by u star then there was a curve followed by a straight line then there is a transition from the curve to the transition sorry the logarithmic one which you call the buffer zone so there i had also pointed out that the laminar sublinear thickness can be found from this relationship y u star by nu equal to 4 then that y corresponds to nothing but the laminar sublinear thickness so that is how y which is equal to delta prime becomes equal to 4 times nu by u star so now you realize why we are looking for u star so I substitute the values 4 times this is the viscosity of air divided by u star okay which is equal to 9.6 into 10 power of minus 6 meters which is a very very small quantity as you see here 9.6 let us say even 10 even if you round off it is 10 to the power minus 2 100 approximately 100 of a millimeter so it is exceedingly small the laminar subject now then again we are familiar with this that in the laminar sublayer the velocity distribution is given by u by u star equal to y u star by nu therefore u equal to i take u star to the other side y u star square by nu y okay is uh, the velocity at the edge of the boundary layer equal to this is your u star this is your y that you have got and nu so it comes to 25.0 meters per second so what does this represent it represents the velocity at the edge of the laminar sublayer. Now, laminar sublayer is so thin, yet you see how the velocity changes so rapidly. On the boundary, it is zero, that is no slip condition. But by the time you are at such a short distance from the boundary, 
one hundredth of a millimeter. By then the velocity picks up to twenty five point zero meters per second. So that means the velocity gradient in that small thickness is exceedingly high. Du by dy is exceedingly high. If du by dy is high, obviously you will get a very high value of boundary shear tau zero. Okay. Now the mean velocity. Next one is find out the mean velocity at edge of the inner zone or wall zone. See, there is one point one five is one limit. Beyond that is the outer zone. Although I say inner and outer, don't confuse. We are still talking about everything within the boundary layer. Okay, so within the boundary layer, the mean velocity at a distance of y by delta equal to 0.15 can be found from this law, which is the defect law. Now you might wonder, why should I apply defect law? I can apply logarithmic law as well, because strictly speaking, inside 0.15 delta, logarithmic law is valid. Outside, defect law is valid. However, people find from experiments that I can still extend the logarithmic law right up to the edge of the boundary layer. Sometimes the other way also you can do. That means extend the defect law right inside the wall region. Of course, not the laminar sublayer, but wherever turbulent flow is there. So it doesn't matter which one you apply. So here you have adopted. U minus U star equal to minus 5.6 log, okay. Uh, y by delta plus 2.5. This is the velocity defect law. Now, if I am interested to find the velocity at 0.15 delta, all that I do is for y I substitute 0.15 delta, so this ratio becomes 0.15. So minus 5.6 log. This ratio is 0.15. Plus 2.5, it comes out 7.113, or just take you start the other side. Then finally, you are interested in small u, which is capital U minus this, so 200 minus 44.46, which is 100 rounded value here, 155.5 meters per second. So you see, out of this 0 to 200. Even within that sublayer itself, it picked up so fast. Even beyond that, even within the first 15 percent of the boundary layer thickness, your velocity is fairly high. One point, sorry, 155.5 meters per second. Subsequently, there is a change in velocity, but the changes are gradual. So by the time you come to the next 85 percent. Thickness of the boundary layer, the change will be from 155 to 200. So, in that big thickness, the changes are very gradual, and that is a physical feature of all turbulent boundary layers. That's what I explained to you. That the changes are very rapid near the boundary. Subsequently, it goes on changing very slowly. But we are Following the same definition for a boundary layer thickness, that it is that value of y where you have 99 percent of the undisturbed free stream velocity. Okay, but the way it changes, it is looks different. This is in contrast to a laminar boundary layer, it is where it is more or less parabolic shape, close to a parabola. Okay, so. You find this quantity. Now that you know the velocity at the edge of the inner zone or the wall region, okay, you can apply also the logarithmic distribution. All right. So this logarithm distribution, you are extending. Right up to the edge, right. So here, as you see, substituting u, I know u star is what I calculated earlier, 5.75 log. Y is 0.15 delta because this is the velocity, 
that you find is at this level into all these you know u star so many meters per second nu 1.5 into 10 power minus 5 plus 4.5 now if i simplify this only unknown is delta which comes out as 5.81 centimeters 5.81 into 81 is approximately little bit bigger than 2 inch about this this height will be the boundary layer thickness now after going through all this you might have some doubt that why do i have to find the velocity first and then use the formula to solve for the unknown boundary layer thickness this one way of doing why you are doing this way is you still do not know or we have not even quoted the formula for boundary layer thickness based on the range of plane or something you can have delta by x equal to some number divided by the nonce number to power of some exponent now that exponent depends on the range of plane or something we talked earlier about the 17th power law in a turbulent boundary if it is 17th power law it becomes the nonce number rex to power of 150 and numerator is some value 0.3 something 328 or not this case so any anyway. but if you go to different range of reynolds number you will have a different formula for delta by x since you don't know that at the moment what you are doing is first finding the velocity at 0.15 delta then making use of the velocity relationship first you found the velocity at the edge making use of the defect law then once i get this i am making use of the logarithmic law and it contains your unknown delta so in a indirect fashion you are able to get this value now if you apply the direct formula there is a possibility that the estimate that you get here for delta could be somewhat different you don't expect everything will be on the dot if it is 5.8 the formula might give you 4.5 maybe 6 something of that order but you should not worry about it because after all delta in a boundary layer thickness the changes are so gradual that to locate even 0.99% of u is very little subjective you can because so little change the value of u will not change much that your judgment could take you off by quite a bit of distance so that really should not matter more important it is the inner zone where you have the sub layer the buffer zone the logarithmic velocity ratio all that is important the reason being ultimately your interest is to find tau zero boundary shear okay and so this more or less completes our introduction to boundary layer theory all right but don't forget about or don't lose focus why we are doing all this boundary layer theory i have explained to you earlier whatever you learn from boundary layer theory you can apply it to flow through pipes always keeping in mind that the counterpart of the boundary layer thickness over a flat plate is same as the radius of a pipe in a fully developed flow fully developed because after that there is no more scope for the boundary layer to grow so boundary layer has attained the full value which is the radius of the pipe and capital u for a flat plate will be replaced by the center line velocity of the pipe okay so making use of these ideas i will summarize and today we are going to start the next bit which is flow through pipe which in a sense is a continuation of our boundary layer theory but since we covered so much in the boundary layer theory knowing about pipe and their behavior as regards resistance is concerned will be a lot easier and we can simply go through very fast okay that's how i plan so let's see this is flow through pipes
and forces acting on a control volume of length L. I have mentioned that to you earlier in one of the lectures. Radius R naught can be equated for a steady flow as what is this part? This what, what does that represent? This part pi R naught per the area, delta P is drop in pressure. So this side there is pressure force, this side there is the pressure force. If I take the difference, it will be same area into differential pressure delta P. So that is now imagine the control volume is the entire cylindrical fluid within the pipe that is your control volume. So this is the force acting on the control volume. Now if it is steady state flow, this force must be in balance with some other force. And what is that some other force? The force which is resisting motion. So if your boundary shear is tau 0, what is the force which is acting over a length of L of a control volume having a radius R naught? So it will be perimeter multiply by L give the area and multiply by tau 0. So this is what is 2 pi R naught perimeter multiply by length give the area on which boundary shear is acting multiply by tau 0. So this you rearrange cancel out terms. So you will get tau 0 equal to R naught by 2 delta P divided by L. Whenever you talk about pipes and their behavior etc. Always is as a standard or as a convenience people stick to the diameter of the pipe not the radius. So that is why let us change it the R naught to diameter. So R naught is substituted D by 2 that becomes D by 4 okay. Now instead of delta P again engineers are more comfortable to talk in terms of columns of head. So what is the conversion P equal to gamma H? Gamma stands for rho into G. So delta P will be equal to gamma which is rho G into delta H by L. What does delta H stand now? Drop in head, pressure head between section this face of the control volume and this face of the other control volume, sorry other face of the same control volume. Okay, so that gives you delta H. So we are only talking in terms of different quantities otherwise formula is the same. Now this is a standard definition for coefficient of friction Cf equal to tau 0 by half rho into V square. Now in case of pipes it is always convenient to talk in terms of the average velocity V rather than the center line velocity which is the counterpart of the boundary layer theory. So we always prefer in a pipe to talk in terms of average velocity. The reason being measuring the average velocity in a lab is very simple. Just collect water or any fluid that flows through over a known time period. So you know the rate of discharge Q, Q divided by area of cross section will give you the average velocity. Okay. So now here we also introduce a friction factor and we say that friction factor we consider it as 4 times Cf. Therefore if I rearrange this what will I get? Okay, 4 times Cf multiply 4 here just manipulate. Finally you will end up with tau 0 equal to friction factor of the pipe okay multiply by all this rho v square divided by 8. Now this is the tau 0 you got it from this mere definition nothing else see all this is you define this again you said you will take 4 times of that value as friction factor and finally from that definition you could get an expression for tau g. Okay. So you are not used any physics other than just a definition. But by considering the forces on the control volume 
you also have an answer for tau 0. So this tau 0 I can always equate with this tau 0 and if I equate the two values of tau zeros, then it is a very simple thing. You cancel out terms, you will get delta H equal to F into L V squared by 2 G D. And this is a very important formula for all your pipe flow problems. Okay, this you can't forget, afford to forget. So head loss. Why we say head loss? There is a drop in head between section 1 and 2. That is why we call that the head loss. So head loss equal to F into L V square by 2 G D and this above expression is known as Darcy Weisbeck formula and it is very you know very popular and this is the one used for every pipe calculation. Now when I did all this analysis control volume and definition etc. Did you have to assume anything about the nature of flow? You did not, is not it? You did not you didn't say whether it is a laminar flow or a turbulent flow. All that you did is take a control volume, find the drop in pressure, then use the definition of Cf, 4 times Cf is F, finally you get tau 0 from here equal to 2, you get an answer Darcy Westbrook equation. So what does that imply? It implies that Darcy's Weisbeck equation can be applied for laminar flows as well as turbulent flows and which is also a good thing in the sense I have a same formula which can be applied for both. But this kind of a simplicity that same formula can be applied for both also has a price associated with it. What is that price? You have to be careful in the choice of the friction factor F for a laminar flow or a turbulent flow in the transition etc. So that is why I said it can be applied both for laminar and turbulent flows to pipes provided F is selected appropriately. This is very important. F is selected appropriately. Now remember Hagen-Poiseuille's flow we did exact solution of Navier-Stokes equation in cylindrical coordinates and what was the end result which is most important is that the friction factor we derived that was equal to 64 by Reynolds number. So if I take F equal to 64 by the Reynolds number and use this value of F in Darcy's Weisbeck formula, I am getting going to get the right answer for the head loss in a laminar flow to a pipe. Is it okay? Now instead of doing all this, I might as well apply directly Hagen Poiseuille's equation. If you go back and refer. There also you can find directly the head loss. Both will give the same answer. Now if you look at that head loss formula of Hagen Poisson, which you derived from the exact solution of Navier Stokes equation, you will find there that the head loss is proportional to for a laminar flow, we have discussed that. Tell me for a head loss in case of laminar flow is proportional to velocity to the power of how much? 1. That means head loss is a linear function of V. You double the velocity, double will be the head loss. Okay. But if you look at, I will just have a very casual look at this formula. What does that show? Head loss is proportional to square of the velocity. There it was linear. Actually, this also is a linear velocity, but it is all built into the definition of F. So, if I substitute F equal to 64 by Reynolds number here 
and cancel out, you will again get the same formula of Darcy's sorry uh, Hagen Poisson equals you follow. So, just looking at that, you are little confused thinking that head loss is proportional to square of the volume. No, it is put in such a way the formula that you will also get the same answer. That is why I said whether you directly substitute in Hagen Poisson's equation the data or you calculate f equal to 64 by r first use this value in Darcy Weisbach's formula you will get the same answer. Now why we prefer to use same formula is that see well, I have one formula all if I am remembering this is lot easier f equal to 64 by Reynolds number. But if you have a good memory, if you go back to the original formula of again Poissons and do it, no harm. You follow my point? See, always people want to unify the approach so that you do not have to remember too many things. However, you need to remember that F equal to 64 by Reynolds number. Okay. Now, we go a little further to find what happens if the flow is not laminar it could be transition, it could be turbulent, again the boundary could be smooth or it could be rough. The explanation for a smooth boundary is rough boundary also depends on the relative magnitude of the projection heights in relation to the laminar sublayer thickness. So, laminar sublayer thickness plays a very important role in many ways. So, here dimensionally all that I say is the drop in pressure is a function we do not know yet what the function is all that we know is depends on so many other parameters what are they the diameter of the pipe makes sense length of the pipe K stands for the roughness height mean velocity of flow in the pipe then density and viscosity. Now, we have not done the dimensional analysis part, the theory behind it, but for the time being, do not worry about it, it will be covered in the second course dimensional analysis. But it is sufficient if you imagine now that all these terms can be combined in groups and each one of them is a non dimensional parameter, meaning is ratio of similar quantities a force by force in non-dimensional length by length is a non-dimensional quantity as you see here L by D this has a length dimension length dimension length dimension length dimension. So, these are all non-dimensional quantities and this is nothing but your Reynolds number and Reynolds number is interpreted as ratio of two forces inertia force by viscous force. So, when I say force by force automatically it becomes non dimensional Here also you can check it is ratio of the pressure force by inertia force. Okay. So, you have this kind of a relationship in non dimensional form. In non dimensional form it becomes very easy to conduct experiments. So, you do not have to depend on individual parameters rather you depend on the combination of those parameters. Okay. Now, same thing instead of pressure you can convert it to delta h drop in head delta p equal to gamma h. So, multiply by rho g both sides. Okay. So, here. So, if I do that rho g rho rho will cancel out. So, you will be left with g into delta h v square is a function of Reynolds number L by d k by d. Okay. Now, this is only a form it does not tell you really the actual relationship the actual relationship between functional relationship you have to establish based on experiments. Now, based on experiments you found that the drop in head is a linear function of L by D meaning if I take double the length of the pipe the drop in head will be double if I have 5 times the length of pipe then the drop it, it makes sense physically because after all it depends on the distance to which 
the fluid travels, the energy is spent. So it is fine. So once you observe that, you can take out of this, write the same thing as L by D into some other function of these two combinations. Okay. Now, whether it is dimensionless in this form or I multiply by half rho v square, sorry, half v square, half, it does not really make a difference. These are all only for convenience and physical interpretation, you can introduce any of these numbers. So, here delta h, which is nothing but the head loss, equal to L v square by 2 g d, you know, to both sides, it does not matter, into this function f1. So, this relationship has come out based only on dimensional analysis. Now, if you compare the same thing with Darcy's formula, you see the similarity. Look at this formula, this formula. So, what is the, what does that tell you now? Compare the two and what do you infer from these two? Head loss equal to here F L V square by 2 G D. Here it is L V square by 2 G D some function phi 1. So, that means the friction factor F in Darcy's function, sorry Darcy's formula is nothing but phi 1 and what is phi 1 is some function of Reynolds number and K by D. So, you infer that the friction factor F in Darcy's formula is a function of Reynolds number and the ratio k by d, k by d is called the relative roughness height because relative to the diameter how big is this projection height that is why you call it a relative roughness height. So, in general the friction factor that is what I said in general the friction factor is a function of Reynolds number and k by d. This is a very general statement. Now, if you are talking about laminar flows, what is the relationship between friction factor and Reynolds number? F equal to 64 by R or RE and in case of laminar flow, this is not in picture. It is only F equal to 64 by RE. That means, K by D is not in picture. So, that also you need to keep in mind that in case of laminar flow through pipes, the friction factor F is independent of the relative roughness height K by D. Now, often just to test your understanding, somebody may give you the data, give you also the roughness height of a pipe, which is also is not, in, is not giving any fictitious thing is the fact roughness height is there and you are asked to find out the head loss. So, always you need to check whether the flow through the pipe is laminar or turbulent. Supposing it happens to be laminar, then the k or k by d value that is given in the problem is really superfluous, it is of no use. So, all that you do is you still apply F equal to 64 by R, whatever value you get, use that value of friction factor in Darcy's formula. Okay. So, that is the important thing, roughness is does not come to you. Now, uh, here again flow when it comes to flow through smooth pipes and that to turbulent flow through smooth pipes, Blasius proposed a empirical relationship to find the friction factor F, which was 0 0.316 by Reynolds number to power of 1 fourth. Okay. And because it is empirical, always it will be valued over a certain range. It will not be, can be applied anywhere you want to, any range. So, the range is the Reynolds number should be less than 10 to the power of 5. So, this formula is uh, quite popular because it is simple. If it is a smooth pipe and if the Reynolds number happens to be 
less than 10 to the 5. You do not have to worry about so many theories, the empirical relation. But later on you will find this empirical relationship is fairly close to the other relationships that we will be talking about. Okay. Again to remind you back the classification of the boundary whether it is uh, whether it is uh, rough turbulent, smooth turbulent, etc. will be based on this kind of an argument. For flow through pipe the following flow zones have been demarcated. Look these are our identical to what we did for boundary layer over a flat plate almost. So when y u star by nu lies between 0 to 4 that what we call the laminar sublayer. Come here when y u star by nu was greater than some range is there let us say 30 to 70 we call that turbulent zone. In the boundary theory we said that all this is valid for y by delta less than 0 0.15 but in a five in a pipe the range is a little different but look at the similarity do not worry about the, the numbers. So it is y it is 0.2 delta so y equal to less than 0.2 delta or y by delta less than delta. then we call that problem zone. Now, this all again I said you know repetition but it gives you the continuity in thought when you apply it to a boundary layer and a flow through pipe. The mean velocity distribution in the laminar sublayer is this u by u star is y star by nu. The distribution in the inner turbulent zone of a smooth pipe by now you should be able to understand what is the meaning of inner turbulent zone. What is this inner turbulent zone? In the case of pi, it is 0.2 delta. That is the inner zone. Okay. Smooth pi can be expressed as again similar, excepting there is small change in this coefficients. So u by u star equal to 5.75 log y u star by nu plus 5.5. Here you need to be a little careful. What is the meaning of y in a pipe? From where are you measuring this distance y? From the boundary, not from the radius, from the center. Okay. What I mean is all this theory, y is always measured from the boundary. Sometimes people get a little confused they, because pipe means you start measuring the distance from the radius. No, then you have to change. If R naught is given, if this distance is given, you have to do all that, right? So be careful to see that. Y, y is the distance from the boundary. Okay. For example, I will ask you radius of the pipe is known let us say 2 centimeters. What is the velocity at a distance of 1.5 centimeters from the radius sorry from the center. Then obviously if I want to apply this formula one has to measure from the boundary. So this is 2 centimeter this is 1.5 so that means this is 0.5. So you have to first get the value of y and then use it just not substitute whatever is given. Now the velocity defect law is also found to be valid over quite a big range theoretically speaking beyond 0.2 delta from the boundary other 80 percent okay. Now and in case of a pipe I am again reiterating delta stands for radius of the pipe. Okay. And same in case of a rough turbulent pipe u by u star equal to 5.75 log y by k plus 8.5 already quoted to you earlier. Velocity defect law even if I apply this subtract one from the other I am going to get u minus u by u star equal to 5.75 log okay, r naught by y. R naught stands for the delta, delta by y. So for both smooth and rough pipes, okay, this, this is the, see we, I am not giving you the derivation but this last bit is quite important. Based on these logarithmic distributions that you have found, you can always integrate over the cross section and find the discharge. 
because u is varying with y or u is varying with r if you count it from here. So based on the formula logarithmic distribution of velocity, I can always find out what will be the discharge through a pipe by integrating those local velocity into that 2 pi r dr annular area. I can find it. Now having found that, I will equate it with the average velocity formula that is pi into r naught square area multiplied by average velocity v. So if I do that, I would be able to derive this expression. Small u stands for the velocity at, at what, what is the location? Center, center line. V stands for average velocity, which is q by a. U star, of course, is your shear velocity equal to 3.75. Okay? And why this was derived is based on this, even extending this a little further. It is possible to derive theoretically these relationships. See derivations I am not able to give, cannot be given, but uh, not difficult, you can find in many advanced books the derivation. So using those relationships, you can get two expressions, one for smooth pipe, one for rough pipe, okay, these all derived with a small change in these coefficients, small changes here and there. Now what is the speciality of these two? Actually these are known as Karman's resistance laws relationship because it could derive. But what is the what is the peculiarity with these two? Look at and tell me. Because we should know the interpretation much better than the derivation. Somebody has derived fine. You know the principle, how it is derived, but more importantly, you should be able to understand meaning of the final expression. So I compare the two, what do I get? I am looking for friction factor, all right, F. So what does this say for a smooth pipe? Friction factor. Now friction factor in this formula happen to be implicit, meaning it appears this side as well as that side. This is an implicit relationship. That is one. Second, what happens to the friction factor? Even if I solve it by trial, what happens to the friction factor? Friction factor depends on Reynolds number, okay? Because it is a smooth pipe, obviously the roughness height k by d is not in picture, okay? Come to a rough pipe, what do you find here? Friction factor depends on whether it is R0 by K or D by K, it does not matter. Radius or diameter, only the numbers will change. So, what they, it depends on the relative roughness height. That is what you would expect. And here, Reynolds number, is it in picture? No. If Reynolds number is not in picture, what does that physically mean as regards? the role of viscosity. Reynolds number is not in picture. So what does that physically tell you as regards the role of viscosity on friction factor? It does not come into picture. That means in viscosity is not going to affect. Only the relative roughness height would matter. So these are the two extremes, one is smooth pipe, one is rough. So in a smooth pipe, the thumb rule you need to remember is friction factor is a function of Reynolds number. In case of a rough turbulent flow or rough pipe, the friction factor is a function of the relative roughness height, okay? But these are the two extremes. It so happens that most of the practical problems fall between these two limits. And that is what is called the transition zone. Means transition from smooth turbulent to rough turbulent. That is what is called transition. And for that kind of a thing, Colebrook and White suggested this formula. 
and the formula beauty of this formula is that when you talk about smooth pipe this curve merges with this relationship when you talk about rough pipes same formula will merge with this means it is connecting two different curves in a smooth fashion later on we will see next time what is the you know meaning of this on a graph how it looks like and how to find out the friction factor depending on the type of flow whether it is a rough flow or the smooth flow we will do that okay so we continue next time that's on uh, monday okay